Yeah, good show today. We've got a little, uh, we got a cool interview that we're going to wrap the show out with. Uh, we'll keep you all in the dark with respect to that for a little bit. And then i uh, got giveaways, a whole bunch of giveaways, courtesy of Paramount, who's always being really, really good to us. Good people and, Paramount. Um, and uh, nobody else died this last week. Oh, yeah. I guess we've got to start <laughs> counting again. we got to yeah. start at the top, take it back to the uh, top. Yeah, gosh. Uh, you know, the um, uh, on the last, uh, when we were talking about everybody who had... Uh, died in the last time we neglected to mention the passing of uh, Machiko Kiyo the uh, great uh, Japanese actress from uh, Rashomon and countless other great films she was you know in the in the 50s and into the 60s she was a, a legend and uh, she passed away as well at age 95 yeah. on May 12th and uh, and what a what a great I mean I, I, you know she was in Ugetsu and she was in uh, uh, Floating Weeds Good long, good, good long, long run, yeah, long career, and uh, acted all the way into the seventies. Ultimately, a couple of movies in the seventies, but uh, did Black Lizard in nineteen sixty two, kind of a legendary uh, uh, Japanese exploitation title. Uh, the Loyal forty seven Ronin, and uh, she did some other movies like The Princess Sen that have never been out here. And I saw that wow. years ago at a, at a festival, and it's, you know, it's kind of a lost film in many respects. But I hope some of that stuff gets rediscovered with her passing. So. Yeah. Anyway, um, so good bunch of good bunch of stuff today. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be an interesting week. So you know, we had our uh, our production adventure last year when you shot your film. Yes. So now uh, I've you're got one this the, next week. You're uh, in the thick of it. Well, it's not my film, but uh, a good friend of mine's making a big short next week, which I'm not at liberty to say much about. But it's a, it's a big short. Like it's a really big short. Uh, it's like a like if you were shooting a feature, but you only shot for five days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and my wife is producing it, and uh, it's it's consumed our lives significantly <laughs> for the last couple of weeks. And we're finally gonna get the cameras rolling on Monday. So. Because making a movie is making a movie, no matter uh, what what the scale. Yeah, the elements all stayed the same. And uh, the, and the and and this thing is. It's a big deal. I mean, it's you know, it's uh, it's everybody's getting paid. In other words, yeah, <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. that's the deal. So it's going to be exciting. It's going to be exciting. Different. I'm doing a company move every day, so uh, we'll be we'll be in the thick of it. So let's get uh, let's get right to it because we do have that interview to cut into the show later on. Uh, starting off, a uh, we got a Blu-ray here from uh, Eagle Vision, Eagle Rock, the music people. Uh, which is a really, really interesting. Like, I don't want to call it a documentary, but it's it's a personal essay about the story of the police, the band, from the point of view of Stuart Copeland. Mm. Stuart Copeland made this himself, uh, and he he produced it, and he wrote it, and he directed it, and he of course has been primarily a film composer for many, many years, uh, all the way back into the eighties, right when you know, right about the time that the police uh, kind of called it quits. Copeland became a he started scoring movies. Everything you know, sort of beginning with uh, Francis Coppola's uh, uh, the oh, why am I drawing a blank? Uh, uh, Rumblefish. Oh, Rumblefish. Yes, yes, yes. Rumblefish. The, the magical realism. Yeah, that, that great, great score. So this is uh, this is basically the story of the police from from his point of view of having been right in the middle of it, and it is called the police. Everyone stares the police inside out. And uh, it's terrific. It's really, really good. You you hear you hear music. You hear versions of some of their stuff, and you hear you know tracks and and uh, recordings and live stuff that have that's never ever been uh, heard before. It's really, really interesting. Uh, some of them are these unreleased derangements mm. that were created specifically for the film too. Uh, so it's uh, it's really, really interesting. There's a commentary on here with uh, Summers and Copeland. They couldn't get Sting to sit for uh, freaking yeah. commentary because yeah. he's doing I don't know downward dog or something. Mm. But um, anyway, it's it's uh, it's terrific. It really is terrific. If you're if you lived through this era, the Police were a seminal band. No, Sting Sting would say I'm living in the present. That, yeah, that's, exactly. That's, that's what he. I'm sure. Yeah, that's exactly what he would say. But it's uh, it's true. But yeah, of course. Yeah, the police. Are you kidding me? Oh, yeah, they they changed everything. You know, they put a little ska in it, and there was a little reggae kind of under under a lot of that stuff too, and. Uh, they pop, you know, it's, it was it was amazing. My, my, my dad took me to New York in 1977, 78, 79, whatever it was, uh, CBGB's. I uh, went to CBGB's. Yeah. And, and, and I didn't see the police pay the, play there, but everybody told me about <laughs> the police play. Yeah, for sure. 
All right, and and uh, another stack of anime. The anime has been fast and furious lately. Uh, a bunch of these things have have come out. Some of this is worth mentioning. Please, twins. It's part of the whole, you know, uh, twins thing. The the the, the 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 twins are an anime uh, phenomenon under themselves that I am not fully aware of. But I've had some some twelve and thirteen year olds tell me like, oh yeah, totally. Uh-huh. So uh, anyway, this is. Um, uh, the, the this is the you know he it's a boy and a girl and um, they have gosh where where is the it's sort of it's sort of like a long lost uh, separated at birth uh, thing and um, oh how do you even describe this phenomenon um, it's. Y- you got to see it. I, uh, there's no other way to describe this. The uh, so check out, please, twins. I think we may have covered one of these uh, one of these twins things uh, previously, but it's uh, it's it's schoolyard stuff, right? It's it's still in that in that school syndrome. These you know these these unusual sisters, and then these twins, these this brother and sister separated at birth. These unusual twins. There's a and then a, some a lot of weird psychological school stuff that goes on, uh, and it kind of turns into a romance at a certain point too. It's very very unusual. Um, the complete collection of Sagrada Reset from Sente. More school stuff. It's unbelievable how I, I wonder how much, how many artists in Japan, in the anime industry actually spend most of their time drawing kids in school uniforms because mm. we cover a lot of it on this mm. show like hundreds i mean how often do you have to draw these kids in uniforms i don't get it anyway um but it's a popular thing kids in school in uniforms superpowers fighting aliens fighting monsters you know uh falling in love and exercising their powers whatever you want it's all kind of an x-men thing i guess uh so anyway uh sagrada reset is part of that and uh you know it's uh, it's fan- it's wish fulfillment it's mm-hmm. uh, wish fulfillment of kids that uh you know uh have superpowers and looking to figure out what to do with them uh we also have season two of freezing vibration which is very very cool a uh, little bit on the somewhat risque side. I, I I wouldn't recommend this necessarily for for teenagers, but it's uh it's it's cool. It's you know female superheroes kind of, and uh, this takes place. This all sort of emerges from Alaska. This the the main kind of superhero base that they operate out of mm-hmm. is you know is in Alaska, which is kind of weird. But uh, that's okay. Like who would go to Alaska? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, the uh, so that's um, you know secret agent superheroes kind of a thing. Let's see what else we got. Um, Idion, the complete series plus the movies, uh, Space Runaway. This is a, a relatively old mecha series, and uh, kind of goes back into the era of Transformers and you know all of that from the early '80s. It definitely looks very early '80s. Uh, it is, uh, it, it's, it, it all kind of takes place on a distant planet where, uh, the earth has now migrated and they're doing archaeology on this, uh, this distant planet. And, uh, what they unearth is a technology, a civilization that kind of blows up in their faces. And, uh, there it is. It's the, uh, the Eid. So this is Eidion. Edeon, Space Runaway, uh, the complete series, plus movies that they did. It's actually kind of cool. I don't know that it's as cool as something like uh, Geta Robo, or e- which is, I guess, from the 70s, or even um, uh, Space Cruiser Yamato and uh, Star Blazers, but I still enjoy it. Um, let's see. Uh, and we've also got... Um, Godanyar, Godanyar, I guess is how you pronounce it. Uh, 26 episodes, the complete collection, also from Sente. Uh, this is a uh, another mecha series, mecha suits and uh, giant robots and, you know, the usual thing. It's just a slightly different universe. The uh, The coolest stuff on here is uh, the uh, the mechanical profiles and the uh, um, all the Japanese commercials that they originally aired for this thing, which are hysterical. I don't know why Japanese commercials make me laugh so much, but they're really, really <laughs> funny. They are. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's uh, it's like Pacific Rim in many respects, except with aliens instead of uh, instead of monsters. But uh, it, it's it's pretty cool. A little bit of, uh, I guess a little bit of Starship Troopers would be in that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Land of the Lustrous. 
is uh, is has a real following. I was looking forward to this. This is uh, from a couple of years ago. I thought that I would really vibe to this just from what I'd seen of the animation previously. I'm not quite sure. Uh, I I I I really understand it. Um, it's uh, the 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 idea here is that you have beings whose bodies are made out of crystals. And uh, that means that there are people who hunt them for the crystal of which their bodies are made. And uh, the crystals have a certain characteristics, shall we say. And uh, it all gets... That's as, as much as it really makes sense. And then it starts to get into this very, very convoluted mythology that, that lost me at a certain point. But animation's great. Animation's really, really first rate. Uh, let's see, uh, Kempfer, more girls in uniforms. It's unbelievable how this, <laughs> what a com- seriously, it's unbelievable what a common theme this is. Uh, so Kempfer is, uh, a female warrior of sorts. And, um, the, the and naturally female warriors all wear these schoolgirl uniforms. It just, I, it doesn't really make sense to me, but this is, uh, this is essentially about a, a schoolgirl who is kind of drawn into a camp for a uh, click and, uh, how they defend each other and, um, you know, how they're, how this, how, what their, what their mission going forward winds up being. Uh, so this is the complete collection. It also has an English dub on it, which I wouldn't recommend. The voices are kind of annoying. And uh, Kokuku, uh, Moment by Moment, K-O-K-K-O-K-U, Moment by Moment, Complete Collection, also from Sente. Really, really interesting animation. Very, very uh, textured, dark lines, lots of shadows. Very, very cyberpunk in a way that I haven't seen since the, uh, since the 80s, frankly. Um, really, really uh, very, very interesting concept. It, the, it's about this family that has the power to stop time. And whenever they do that, they enter this alternate dimension where time doesn't exist. It's really kind of a fascinating concept. And um, there winds there, there's a, there's like a there's a there's a particular incident that happens to this family so that they're forced to use this power. And this is all about solving that crime, the um, and how you have actually a race against time when there is no time. Which is an interesting concept. I think it's just really, really cool. Wow. So uh, this is the complete collection of Kokuku, uh, K O K K O K U. Really, one of the more interesting anime uh, concepts I've seen in a very, very long time. And then, lastly, from Funimation, uh, we have Hakata Tonkotsu Ramens. That's right. The only word that I understand there is ramens. Uh, this takes place in uh, the city of Fukuoka. Which is this really? It's it's almost like uh, a, a Japanese anime version of Sin City or something. I would normally I would um, I would I would analogize this to Wicked City, which is of course an anime uh, legend. But it's it feels at times more like Sin City, like a colorful Sin City. Uh, it's a it's a really really you know I, I don't know why anybody would want to go to Fukuoka the way that it's depicted here. It's just lots of just scumballs and killers and. Horrible, horrible people, and um, uh, there's even a, uh, a a transvestite assassin here, which is kind of a weird thing in a lot of Japanese live action and anime films. I'm not quite sure why that is a recurring theme, but it is, and uh, th- that that's what this is all about. It's about a bunch of people just uh, with with ulterior motives navigating the uh, seedy underbelly of Fukuoka, and uh, it's. I don't know that it's uh, highly recommended, but it certainly has its moments. And if you like Sin City, you will probably respond to it. Cool, cool, cool. That's it for our anime this week. Uh, let's move to some new movies. A few new movies I think we have over here. I will start out with a Blu-ray. The J.T. Leroy story, Kirsten uh, Stewart uh, and Laura Dern. This was, an, this, was, this was an interesting sort of situation. So this was, this was based on one of those... Uh, I remember this whole thing when it transpired. One of those crazy literary hoaxes. Yeah. You know. It was um, amazing. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. But it was like a double hoax. Yeah. It's a double layered hoax. And, 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 and what struck me as most interesting about it, so you have this, you have this person, this young writer who called J.T. Leroy, puts out this book, but becomes a bestseller. Yeah. Uh, except that they're, they're which is like an autobiographical thing all, about your tough upbringing life and, and, you know, life and drugs yeah, and all this kind of yeah. stuff like that. And uh, and apparently J T. Leroy, but people, who's J T. We want to meet just J T. Leroy. All right. Yeah. 
There is no JT Leroy. No. I'm not giving anything away here. There is no JT Leroy. Yeah. So, um, people thought it was a male first. Thought too. it was they a male a first. So, uh, uh, a woman named Savannah uh, 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 Coop, who is the person who wrote the memoir in the first place, yeah. um, um, uh, has a brother who, is, who uh, has a sister in law. Uh, has a, a, a sister. A sister. Yeah. And she gets the sister to take on the persona of this person, <laughs> JT it. Leroy, who doesn't exist. And to be the human being sort of in the it's world. Crazy. And, and because And because, you know, it's a sister and not a dude. It's, she's very effeminate. Yeah. But, but, but everyone just assumed it was an, a, a sort of an effeminate gay boy. Yeah. And this, and this whole wild thing. Now, uh, what happens is uh, the, the the writer, Savannah, starts to get jealous. Yeah. And, so, you know, because now she's getting all the kudos for the stuff to the right. What's, what, what, what gets lost in this wacky story sometimes is that the non-existent J.T. Leroy's writing was actually quite good. Yeah. The novel was compelling. It was actually completely and totally whole cloth and fiction, but it was nevertheless compelling. And I think that gets lost a little, a little bit sometimes in the story. Nevertheless, uh, uh, it, this made for a neat movie uh, on Blu-ray. It doesn't come with much by way of additional materials, but I don't know if you're, if you're into uh, sort of unraveling those sort of hoaxes. That one, can, this one, can be a lot of a fun. Now there's a, there's an interesting. I'm going to throw a little a quick little anecdote on that. So the the J T Leroy and I actually didn't mind that film. Uh, I, I thought it had had I thought it had its moments. It it, it could have gone further. It could have done more. But I thought it, it did a relatively decent job and had some good performances. But what's interesting in there is the the Diane Kruger, the uh, uh, German actress, plays a character who is a who is basically uh, Aja Argento. Because they don't say that because there's a lot of controversy there. Because did the did the you know the uh, Kristen Stewart character uh, who's pretending to be J T. Leroy did she have an affair with Aja Argento? Apparently mm-hmm. they did while they were making the hardest deceitful above all things, which mm-hmm. was adapted from one of those books. My wife actually worked on that, mm-hmm. and so I remember that was being shot, and everybody was like, "Oh, J T. Leroy, J T. Leroy," and everybody kind of was under the. That's when the hoax was in full bloom, in right? Full, yeah. And then I remember when the whole thing just unraveled, and we were just we were laughing about it. We were just like, "That is so bizarre." That 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 just that, that poor misbegotten film. Yeah. Now we understand why it, why everything went behind the scenes in the film was completely haywire. Yeah. Well, now we suddenly understood because these people were involved in some crazy yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, interesting stuff. Uh, Sebastian Lilo in 2013 made a film called Gloria. Uh, and he more or less uh, last year remade that exact same film called Gloria Bell. Why? Why do they do these? You things? know, uh, I, I, the, I mean, I, I, look. Other than the fact that the other film was in a foreign language, and and, uh, and, and, and but other than that, it's the same film, the same story, more or less. This one simply happens to star uh, Julianne Moore and John Turturro and and Sean Astin and a few other people. But the movie is essentially the same. It's about a woman, a sort of free spirited woman by night, uh, middle aged woman, middle aged woman, yeah. and it's about both of the movies about a woman of a certain age. So uh, she meets this man uh, of a certain age, and they start this affair. And the and the question of both films is. What whether or not he will be able to let go of the baggage of his life yeah. and join her in living out the, you know, the rest of their lives yeah. together, free and happy, the way young people do. Yeah. Or you know, supposed to, anyway. I don't really think that's true. <laughs> uh, but more or less, it's the same film made the same. And it's, I suppose it's, you know, it's, it's funny and sweet and all that kind of stuff, but the movie was just fine <laughs> the, the, yeah. the, the first time around when it was in Spanish with subtitles. Nevertheless, this one you won't have to read. Special features uh, include An Extraordinary Woman, The Making of Gloria Bell, and an and audio commentary with direct Sebastian Lilo, and in which he does, in fact, speak to the question of, yo, Sebastian, yeah. why'd you do this movie two times? Uh, and I, and he, he, he answers the questions very lucidly. You know, it's not unusual that directors remake their own movies. It has happened since the silent era. Cecil B. DeMille made The Ten Commandments in The Silent, and then he remade it again in, the ni- in 1956, obviously the more legendary version of it. Uh, Hitchcock remade The Man Who Knew Too Much. And I... In in fil- in cases like that, I get it because you feel like you can really improve mm. on the previous version. But in cases like this, where it's o- they're only separated by a couple of years, and it's usually a foreign director remaking his original film in English, uh, clearly with a bigger payday. Yeah. But I would be bored. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Would, I'd be bored just walking out there with a whole different cast and a whole different crew. 
and shooting exactly the same scene that I just did about 18, 24 months earlier, I'd just be so bored. Just I, uh, I, I, in I, English is all it really is. But if they're throwing cash at you, I yeah. guess why not? Then there is that. A Point of No Return, that was remade from the French film. Uh, La Femme de Quita. Thank you. Yeah, but it, but it wasn't Besson making it. It was Joe Schumacher. Yeah, 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 different. Yeah. It was just a remake. Yeah. Um, a Vigilante, Olivia Wilde film. You know, uh, so this harkens back to the old sort of films back in the day, uh, uh, Sleeping with the Enemy. Yeah. Uh, in uh, a few of those uh, young woman uh, abusive, I, I, and I, you remember I, I covered this on Film Week and oh, I yeah. recommended it to you. I oh yeah, like, you got to see this. Yeah, it's a good it's movie. A, yeah, it's a good yeah, movie. Yeah, um, uh, you know, abusive husband uh, goes off, trains herself up, gets yeah. her, gets her skills down. Pat and basically comes back and becomes the equalizer. Yeah, you got a problem. She's, she's teaching. She's she's intervening where she's she's out there, right? She's mm-hmm. mysterious, and and if there's a woman or 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 anybody, frankly, but but generally women, women in particular, in, yeah. in particular who who needs somebody to kind of like make an abusive somebody go away she shows up word goes out through the grapevine very secretive way that you can recruit her and she is lethal yeah I love the first half of this movie the second half gets a little conventional but I think for for her, uh, Olivia she has never been better yeah well, a, it's as good as any of those boy vigilante films absolutely. of the last 45 years really Terrific. I like but I like it better because it's a woman in the I lead agree. in the boy vigilante films uh, very often they spend a lot of time beating up a woman. Right yeah, or yeah. or something like that, so that the man can come in and avenge that woman. But we spend a lot of time with a woman watched getting beat up or locked in a cage, whatever it yeah. is, and then the man. That, that doesn't happen in this movie. Uh, we understand, you know, what's going on when she gets there. She's taking care of the problem. That's uh, it. And uh, and I, you got you got to love it. And plus, I love this clean, simple. Yeah, cover. right. It's her That's face, nice. her hands, her two weapons. And a vigilante. That's it. That's a cool thing. Uh, isn't it romantic? Rebel Wilson Lee Hemsworth film with Adam Devine. Isn't it romantic? No, no, it's not. It's not romantic <laughs> at all. It's not. It's a terrible movie. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm losing it with Rebel Wilson. Yeah. A couple of good turns and uh, those pitch perfect. Films, yeah. You know. Uh, but uh, she's she's working that same joke. I'm a sassy. I'm a sassy, overweight uh, Aussie. Uh, Aussie. You know. <laughs> okay. I that's, know. That was true six movies ago. I know. Uh, whatever, she's. Whatever. You know. Um, I I kind of feel like she should have had a sitcom. That's where she. This is this you know, is a TV personality. It's 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 where it's why so many. It's why look. Let's be honest. Tim Allen, notwithstanding the toy the Toy Story movies, mm-hmm. Tim Allen is a TV sitcom guy mm-hmm. because he ba da ba da ba ba da ba da ba joke ba da ba da ba ba da ba joke. That's home improvement. That's everything he's ever done. Same with George Lopez. Mm-hmm. Same with Jerry Seinfeld. God love him. He's one of the wealthiest human beings on the planet. Mm-hmm. But could Jerry Seinfeld have carried a movie? Nope. No, because he's like joke. Yeah, joke. And that's a TV rhythm. That's a sitcom rhythm. You can deal with that for thirty minutes and then let it dissipate for a week. Come yep. back and there it goes again. And that's where she, that's where Rebel Wilson belongs. She it, belongs on a sitcom. It, it's one notch above a uh, talk show host. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, you know, Roseanne. It's like, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And sometimes they don't they don't even work in the other direction. You know, the yeah. sitcom guy can't really host a talk show. Uh, True, but neither one of them are real. Jay Leno made a movie. With uh, Pat Morita, I remember that. Oh my word! Uh, and, and and tapped out forever. Yeah, <laughs> true. When, and he's he, the first person to tell you that. Yeah, yeah. Tapped out. He's like, no, I'm not. Pl- plainly, yeah. I'm not a. Plainly, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, so, isn't it romantic? It is not. Special features, deleted scenes. Uh, Ruben Brandt Collector. What did you think? This is an animation. I hated uh, it. It was very bizarre. I yeah, hated the, the animation. This. The animation is an interesting thing. It's sort of almost a sort of triplets oh. of Belleville sort of physical thing going on. It's the narrative though is I just didn't quite uh, get my mind around it. Uh, he's it's just, very aggressively animated. It's it, it tries to have this kind of German expressionist, yeah. very angular, noirish thing going on. Uh, it it tries to be very meta with respect to to artworks and famous uh, artists and I, yeah, it, psychoanalysis, uh, your motivating sort of it uh, just I I got I didn't I couldn't make heads or tails of it. it I just sat there and I got a headache after about fifteen <laughs> it's, minutes. It's funny the guy the, the guy Ruben he, yeah. he's having these horrible nightmares. Yeah. Uh, they drive him to uh, go out and steal these paintings. He steals thirteen. He takes his patients with him. Some of his patients have these particular <laughs> and, and they steal these paintings and he becomes the most wanted art thief in the world. 
Yeah. Uh, and now everybody starts coming out. Gangsters are coming after him. The police are coming after him. And it all has to do with these nightmares that he's mm. having and what these nightmares are all about. Uh, I understand I'm, more about the movie from what you just said than from having watched it. <laughs> Seriously. That, uh, 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 yeah. it, it, w- what is interesting in the movie are the representations of the art that, that he's stealing. Yeah. That's sort of in- interesting because nothing looks like what it actually True. looks like. The, yeah. the, the art is also represented in this particular sort of animated form. Crazy. Um, I wish that they would have put something on this. The one, the, the correct thing to put on this as a special feature yeah. is the commentary of both a psychoanalyst and an art historian. Yeah, if you can find you know one or two and have both, that's what you want as a special feature on this. Not so much a film critic yep. as uh, as as people to 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 give commentary on the subject of the movie. But you know what are you going to do? Uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie. Yay! I go back with the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers all the way back to about 1991, 92 when they first came out. Uh, Saban. Yeah. Uh, I knew the Pink Ranger uh, uh, fairly well. She was cool. Bridget was in acting. My wife was in acting class with her. Yep. Uh, somehow these the, they they keep managing to just sort of recreate themselves. They're they're like this weird little franchise on the fringe of all yeah. the franchises. The Mighty mm-hmm. Morphin Power Rangers. They keep coming back. They keep coming back. And here they are again, uh, doing what they usually do. Um, what what's fun about this are the special features. They look back at the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, including. Uh, interviews with all the old school guys, including the director of this this film, Brian Spitzer, uh, and all the young stars. Uh, an original featurette and a trailer. But I, that look back stuff where yeah. they go through and, the, and you, you, mm-hmm. get, you get to see footage of all your old favorite Power Rangers, the mm-hmm. White Ranger. I was kind of into that guy myself. Uh, <laughs> the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers on Blu-ray. Uh, the Haunting of Sharon Tate, a Hillary uh, Duff movie. Uh, <laughs> oh man. You know, they just they just kind of blew up at Tarantino a little bit, and he snapped back at uh, the Cannes Film Festival when they complained that Margot Robbie didn't have enough screen time as Sharon Tate in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And uh, he snapped back at him. I think they, they need to take a look at this just to appreciate how badly someone can play Sharon Tate. Yeah. I, yeah look, I don't even uh, know what this, this means exactly. Based, based on Sharon Tate's dreams, how they know what she dreamed about, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, and the Mansion Family Nightmare. What the hell are you talking about uh, here, people? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the sort of yeah. background of the whole sort of thing. Yeah, it plays out. It's not good. There is an audio commentary with the director. Maybe he'll explain it to you premonitions of death or something. It's <laughs> silly crap. Greta, uh, Isabel Huppert, and Chloe, uh, Moret, uh, uh, Chloe Grace Moretz. In this fairly midland thriller, uh, young young woman finds uh, a, a purse, uh, returns it to the rightful owner. Played, yeah. yeah, yeah, this this woman, Isabel Luper. Isabel Luper. She's a piano teacher. They start a relationship. The young woman's <laughs> mother had recently died, so she has a reason to sort of get in there. And man, oh man, <laughs> Isabel Luper is crazy. It just goes, it just goes <laughs> totally bad crap crazy. And these are apparently a thing. There's a, a new one came out a couple of weeks ago called Ma. Yeah. In theaters, Octavia Spencer. Yeah. Older woman. Yeah. Hangs out with these kids. And, uh, and and goes crazy. So is this a, like a new subgenre of crazy old lady movies? Uh, you know, I think it. Uh, see, here's the thing. I I actually enjoyed a lot of this because it's a Neil Jordan film. Yeah, I like Neil Jordan. Neil Jordan's been kind of hit and miss since Game, Crying uh, Game and, and the Interview and with the Dreams, Vampire, and then vampire. and then he went off the rails for a long time and didn't do. Much. I mean, you know, The Butcher Boy is another one that I'm, I'm oh, wow. that has yeah, yet to be on Blu-ray. One. I haven't thought about that in years. Right. Uh, and so I felt like Neil Jordan was a little bit bad. But also he's winking at us. He knows that this is this is a little bit of De Palma. This is a little bit of Hitchcock. He knows that this is basically Norman Bates as as a French actress. And Isabelle Huppert, frankly, it's a lot of Chabrol because she played that crazy broad yeah. in half a dozen Chabrol movies. And Neil Jordan knows that. So that's why he cast her. He's, yeah. He he said, you know, he says to her in his in his Irish way, I'm sure he said, Isabel, all that stuff you did for Chabrol. Yeah. Turn it up to 11. <laughs> Let's just take it right. In fact, go for 15. Take it as far as you want. You go as crazy as crazy. you want. Have do what all do go as far as Chabral would not let you go. <laughs> I want it all. I want it all. You could not be too All crazy. right. So we got a bunch of great giveaways here. Here they go. You ready for this? This is this is courtesy of Paramount for Father's Day. And we need to get our we need to get uh, everything in by the 9th. If you can get us 
your emails by the 9th. We will, on the morning of the 10th, we will uh, select the winners, and we will let Paramount know. You can apply for all of these. You can send us an email for all of these. You can enter them all. Just know that if you, that you can't win multiple ones. So if, there, if you want to kind of improve your odds of not getting something that you don't want and getting something you do want, don't, don't enter for something that uh, you're not really, really uh, passionate about. So uh, we are going to give away... Uh, a Blu-ray of the complete 22nd season of South Park. Mm. We're going to give away one. Send all, Now, remember, all of these, I'm going to say this once, email to godsdigigods.com or gods at cinegods.com. Put your name and address in the body of the email, and I'm going to give you the code word that you put into the subject line. These are the words put in the subject line to enter. For the uh, complete 22nd season on Blu-ray of South Park, write Cartman, C-A-R-T-M-A-N. <laughs> Um, we are also going to give away, there's only going to only giving away one of those. We're giving away one Blu-ray of the Godfather trilogy, the Corleone legacy. One of those. The word is Brando, B-R-A-N-D-O. We're going to give away one Blu-ray, 25th anniversary of Forrest Gump. You're going to put wow. Bubba yeah. in the subject line. Bubba Gump. Uh, we're going to give away one Blu-ray of Jack Ryan Season 1, which we're also going to talk about momentarily. Jack Ryan Season 1, one Blu-ray. Put Jack in the line, in the subject line. We're going to give away one Blu-ray Mission Impossible 6 movie collection. A six-movie Mission Impossible collection on Blu-ray. Put Cruise in the subject line. We're going to give away a Bumblebee uh on uh, the the you know the uh, the Transformers Bumblebee uh collection uh on Blu-ray just put B in the subject line B E E We're going to give away Saving Private Ryan on 4K put private in the subject line We're also going to give away uh the 4K of 13 Hours Michael Bay's 13 Hours the Benghazi movie we're giving away two copies of that so put hours, H-O-U-R-S, hours, H-O-U-R-S, in the subject line. Again, to gods at digigods.com or gods at cinegods.com. And we are singing Paramount's praises right now. They have done us right. And that brings us to the 4K of 13 hours. The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi, uh, which, oddly enough, stars the man who stars in uh, Jack Ryan. Um, who, you know, I would have thought that... Uh, uh, would, Kr- Kr- Krasinski? Yeah, John Krasinski. I would have thought that he'd be a comedy guy after The Office, and he's become... Yeah, but yeah, yeah he, like, he, went, he, went, he went all hardcore. Went all that, hard the, 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 action. Yeah, yeah he's, he's the guy now. But, um, <coughs> excuse me. But, yeah, you know what? Uh, regardless, irrespective of all of the, the, the political stuff, and I think this film was sabotaged a little bit because a lot of people thought that this was timed to hurt to uh, hurt Hillary Clinton during the election and, mm. and whatnot. Mm. And I think it faded a little bit because of that. Truth is, this is not a political film. It doesn't make a statement. doesn't hurt anybody. doesn't help anybody. It, it's the most serious film that Michael Bay has attempted to make, mm. frankly, um, since, uh, what was the, what was the, what was the, the, the first per- thing? Pearl Harbor? No, even before Pearl Harbor, since uh, the the Rock. Oh, the Rock, yeah, which was not terribly serious, but nevertheless, um, um, uh, it's as serious as he gets. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, you know, I and I actually find this to be a very, very skillfully made film. Well, uh, it, it, it does it, it does intend to tr- you know uh, track the events in some in a in a, in a fairly methodical Lin- linear linear methodical way, way. You know, yeah. to the extent that we know something happened when that's what that's the way he tries to lay out that movie. Um, uh, what's funny is the movie is not terribly jingoistic either. No. That DVD cover is. Yeah, that, that's right. The DVD the, cover is for with, sure. But the movie's not. So the I don't know. That's not. an interesting thing. Uh, it looks great on 4K. It really does. The HDR is just superlative, The especially when you get into the night stuff, the the the, the blacks and, uh, and you know, the, uh, the, the, the motion inside the blacks. The artifacting that even you get in the Blu-ray is gone. It's just, it's pristine. It's beautiful. It's fantastic. It's really, really well done. Uh, and, uh, you know, you get uh, an hour of behind-the-scenes stuff from uh, EPK and whatnot. Uh, it's pretty great. And then the other 4K stuff this week is all Batman-related. The first one, I'm going to get this right out of the way. It's a DC animated movie on 4K Ultra HD with a Blu-ray and a movie's anywhere digital, uh, dig- uh, digital locker access. This is a movie that is as weird as anything I have ever seen in my life. Now, let me just say, I remember... 
when a, the second incarnation of Scooby Doo mm-hmm. back in the seventies decided to go all celebrity on us. This mm-hmm. is before their current association with the WWE. I remember when it was, oh, every week a new bunch of celebrities are paired with Scooby Doo on their mystery, mm-hmm. and it was Don like Knotts. The, the three St- Don Knotts, the Three Stooges, the Three Stooges. <laughs> like really? Are you kidding me? And then Batman and Robin. Batman, yeah, that Batman, was so crazy. Batman and Robin with Casey Kasem voicing Robin on Scooby Doo. How do you do that? Because he's already Scoop voicing Shaggy. How do you? I don't understand like i was even sophisticated enough at that time to figure out that there, there's something weird going on here okay but that doesn't hold a candle to the 4k the inexplicable 4k ultra hd release of batman versus the teenage mutant ninja turtles i'd like to know <laughs> where on what how on earth does this the, the mutant ninja turtles aren't even a dc thing <gasps> i don't i don't understand this it's like it's just weird, uh, but Warner has gone and done it. They went and did it, and does it work? I don't know. I uh, I, I, I I don't know. I I it's. Sort I of, just I, know if I'm Batman, I'm not fighting with those turtles. <laughs> it's sort of. I'm sort of. I'm, you're I'm numb. Batman, damn it! It's numbing. It's weird. It's just surreal. I don't understand the point, and I'm not even. You know, yeah, the plot kind of matters, I guess. But you, you find that, honestly, most of the time, you're not really concerned about f- solving the crime. You're just sitting there looking at the TV going, <laughs> why is Batman on my TV with the, with the turtles? I don't understand. Oh, this is man. totally wrong. Yeah. Uh, and then we also have the, uh, the four original Batman movies on 4K Ultra HD. Uh, with relatively terrible artwork on the cover, I, I will add. Uh, Batman, uh, the original Batman, the Tim Burton Batman. Uh, Batman Returns, which my mother-in-law is an extra in, and it's thoroughly hilarious to pick her out of the crowd. Uh, and then, of course, we have the, uh, the, the, the two Joel Schumacher films, when Joel Schumacher took over for Tim Burton. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, that includes Batman Forever, with uh, Val Kilmer playing Batman, and Tommy Lee Jones and Jim Carrey playing the baddies. Uh, and Jim Carrey was a was a really good Riddler, and then of course the uh, the much maligned one that sort of killed the franchise until they went uh, to Christopher Nolan to resurrect it, Batman and Robin, with George Clooney playing Batman and Arnold Schwarzenegger playing Mister Freeze and Alicia Silverstone as Batgirl and Uma Thurman as Poison Ivy and uh, Chris O'Donnell, of course as uh, as Robin, uh, re- re- reprising Robin. So um, here's the thing: you may not remember this, but I remember this very well. I remember Batman and Robin. We saw this, all mm-hmm. four of us, mm-hmm. you, Bridget, mm-hmm. me, mm-hmm. my wife, mm-hmm. and we saw it at the Village Theater in Westwood. Oh, yeah. All gone. And no, we still s- there. Still there. Still there. Yeah. And we sat on the front row <laughs> of the balcony. <laughs> yeah. I remember this. is like yesterday. I remember this so well. Uh, and that scene at the end where Robin is like surfing down to earth. I don't even remember what the context was, but somehow, for some reason, he's surfing in, the, in midair. <laughs> and I remember you laughing. <laughs> I remember you laughing. You were almost <laughs> inconsolable. You were laughing so hard. And we walked out, and no one said anything. And, of course, all the press people are circulating there in the, in the, uh, the courtyard of the Village Theater. And we stood right on the corner, right in front of the newspaper boxes. Yeah. And none of us wanted to say anything. And you broke the silence. And these are the words that you said. Uh. You said these words. <laughs> well, <laughs> I will say this. That was filmmaking with reckless abandon. <laughs> I remember that. And, and that is one of my treasured oh. moments. And I just thought, that's, that's Tim just nailing it perfectly. <laughs> oh, my God. That was so funny. That was so funny. <laughs> hey, no, no, he just pulled the ripcord on that movie. Yeah, he's he just did. Like, you know what? What the hell, guys? Let's yeah. see uh, the nipples on that other one. Um, uh, shall we, shall we yeah, do a, a so bit of anyway. over here? Anyway, look, all of these movies look terrific. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say what nobody wants to say. The Schumacher films look better. They look yeah. better. Well, they're more col- colorful. They're more colorful, and he shot them in in three strip Technicolor mm-hmm. or in a format that emulates three strip Technicolor. So he intended it for it to be very saturated in the way that uh, 50s and 60s musicals were, the way mm-hmm. that The Wizard of Oz was, mm-hmm. uh, in in that very rich, thick color way that's almost super realistic. Yeah. So or super unrealistic, super uh, you know just. A, a very, very um, just saturated. And, you'll, and if you remember that movie, that movie is full of primary colors. Full of primary colors. <laughs> and, and they just jump off the screen. And they don't bleed. That's the thing. Even in Blu-ray, that stuff bleeds a little bit. Uh, the 4K is is really spectacular, especially on those two Schumacher films. Mm. So well worth it. And, of course, all the extras that you're entitled to, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a decent set.
Batman. No, yeah. No, yeah. yeah. Where, anyway. where are we going with that? We're going to so, do with Batman next. Uh, well, Matt, he just cast well, yeah, Robert I, Pattinson. Yeah, I know. You know, but, you know, I mean, but we, we've already done Dark Batman. You cast Robert Pattinson, you got to do Dark Batman. Uh, so we've had, uh, yeah. you know, we, Christian Bale was Dark Batman. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, dude, I'll just say it. My favorite Batman, Michael Keaton. It's it's very funny when when Matt was announced as directing when that was made official that he was directing Batman I I sent a text I sent him a text that was not returned and uh, the, my text was uh, if you don't give Adam West a cameo so help me I'm never gonna forgive you <laughs> he, didn't return. he never returned that he never returned uh, that. Adam's gone now it's not see he blew it I know, he had right? an opportunity yeah he blew it. But anyway, uh, yeah, so I mean, I trust Matt's judgment. I'm assuming that that's not a Warner Brothers thing. So let's see how Pattinson to, to, does. To me, that's like, that's like that brief moment that Nick Cage was going to play Superman. Uh, to yeah, a, right. to a, I think it was a Kevin Smith. It was a Kevin a, Smith thing. Script, yeah, he was. You know. That's, right. that's and, right. And, you know, and while that seems interesting, like in your head, no way that was going to make any sense. No. With, with, particularly back then when Newt, Nick Cage was doing all that brooding sociopaths stuff that he no. was doing. Uh, right. TV. A little, little, little bit of TV. Yeah. So, so the, the, the Jack Ryan season one, of course, which is, a, which is one of our giveaways, uh, the Blu-ray, if I'm not mistaken. We just announced that. Season one of Jack Ryan. So um, these, these, the, the, the adap- adaptations of Tom Clancy novels has gone from, oh, things like uh, Sean Connery and uh, Hunt for Red October uh, and, and worked this, the, through two or three people playing uh, this character uh, in cinema. I think Alec... Alec Baldwin had a shot at him once. I think Ben Affleck had a shot at him once. Yep, and 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 now here this character is. I, I almost said devolved to television. That's not fair. No, but 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 it is clear that this this run of of uh, Tom Clancy Jack Ryan uh, character novels will not be seen on the big screen anymore. And it's just interesting to me in the course of about thirty years, because yep. if I'm not mistaken, Hunt for Red October was about ninety. Uh, and here we are, you know, uh, uh, 2019, almost almost 30 years. Uh, and Jack Ryan is no longer a movie star. <laughs> Jack, Isn't it? Jack it's, Ryan, it's funny. Jack Ryan is a is a television guy. He's more or less Magnum PI. John Krasinski, <laughs> <laughs> he, kind of is. he really is. John Krasinski yeah. just does not work for me as this guy. But it's only because he does not work for me. As uh, you know, I better than Ben Ford. Affleck. Better than Ben Affleck. Well, yeah, you know, uh, um, uh, but to me, I, I, Harrison Ford, yes. I like that Alec Baldwin portrayal of this character first. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I I I just like I like that portrayal. But I, I, I do too. Uh, Alec Baldwin was the was the one that I always thought was the best. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, anyway, it works. It works the way it works. This is season one. Special features include a few deletes and deleted scenes. What I would have loved for them to put on this, they should when they, when they get ready to put these things out, they should check with me and, and say, Tim, what do you want on these things? I want uh, a commentary track here explaining. Uh, the the history and evolution of all of these things from Tom's books right through those movies that we just talked about yep. to how it all becomes uh, conceived as a television series, most of which has nothing to do whatsoever with any one of those Tom Clancy books. The, these are all whole cloth yep. episodes here and how you maintain the care. I would love to hear the filmmakers talk about that and how yep. you maintain a sort of cohesiveness of character. Uh, but they didn't do it. So, you know, next time check with me. <laughs> uh, the Venture Bros. The uh, 2003 is when this uh, animates series popped on and i always thought of it as something sort of like a uh, sort of bizarro world johnny quest yeah you know? yeah yeah uh, you, got, you, you got this guy rusty venture he was a child prodigy he's the sort of washed up hack doctor he has these two moronic sons you know <laughs> not exactly haji and johnny uh they have a bodyguard who's competent yeah. and extremely capable and they roam around the world doing all the crap that they do that's that's, that's johnny quest that's except that johnny quest was serious yeah and uh and so so a little bit more uh i spy i suppose sure. something like that that, that than this this is wacky and goofy, but nevertheless a lot of fun. I used to watch it back in the day. So uh, this is the Venture Bros. Exclusive extras uh, include in, uh, some sort of uh, uh, season. Oh, this is season seven, by the way. This was Adult Swim stuff, so it's sort of like yeah. rated. I, I, they don't rate things R, PG-13 but PG thirteen or something yeah. like that. Venture Bros. Yeah. All right, that's cool. Ooh, the Brady Test Brady Bunch TV and movie collection. All five Brady movies. Yeah. <laughs> plus four different Brady series. People mm-hmm. think there was only the one. No. You know, the Bradys grew up, and the, the yeah. people, you know, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, two, uh, two new to DVD. So this is, this is like a 31 disc collection of everything that you wanted to get involved with that was Brady. Uh, you have to be such a Brady head 
to to want all of this. I can't. I I know people who love the original show. I know people who love you know the the newer movies that kind of spoofed the show. Mm. I don't know anybody that oh, the, says the, the, there was a I play mean, that went out there on the road. I think it was a musical. Uh, I don't know anybody that would want all of this, but you know, God love you if you do. Uh, they they went and they they created what must be some kind of a narcotic for for a certain segment of the population. I don't I don't I don't get it, but whatever. They even it's a custom box. I oh yeah, it's a lovely before. box. It, that, the little it, boxes and they it, have the animated Brady's in there. And, yeah. Uh, and, it's crazy. Uh, and, and, and every every Greg and every Peter like, and every I Bobby. It was an animated show. Yeah, it was an animated Brady. Ridiculous. Yeah, yeah it was pretty neat. Uh, the five Brady movies, by the way, just in case you're wondering, man, I wonder what the name of those five Brady movies were. Uh, the Brady Bunch <laughs> movie, uh, a very Brady sequel, a very Brady Christmas, Growing Up Brady, the Brady Bunch. In the White House. Oh dear, Frank, I, I didn't see that. <laughs> I, I didn't even know it existed. I don't, well, I don't remember that one at all. Oh Brady man, was, I wonder who was president back then. Yeah. Ooh, I love this 1968 adaptation of Tennessee Williams. Boom. Yeah. Uh, uh, with, uh, yeah. with, uh, Richard, with uh, Richard Burden and Elizabeth Taylor. Yep. I think they had already been divorced and remarried w- once by then, uh, if Something. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. This is a big, sexy, streetcar name, desire, scale, uh, the, the dramatic Tennessee uh, yeah. Williams film. Uh, it comes with the au- an audio commentary by filmmaker John Waters, which is just a fantastic thing. Yeah. Tennessee Williams uh, said specifically that this it was his favorite adaptations of any of, any of his work. So, you know, um, that's nuts. That's crazy. Yeah. I don't know why you would say that because it's yeah. not. Uh, but he liked it the best, so go with it. Boom. And uh, a little bit in that vein, we're going to talk about Sex Madness Revealed uh, with Pat Oswald and uh, Rob Zabretsky. Um, so this is in the, the mystery science theater vein, and Pat Oswald obviously has some, uh, has some connection to that, uh, that world as well. And uh, this takes a... Um, a, a movie that was known in 1938 as Sex Madness, also known under the title Human Wreckage, and it uses that as its uh, its mystery science theater fodder. Mm. And you get the uh, the wisecrack track with uh, with, with Pat Oswalt and uh, Rob Zabretsky. And it's I, look, I really don't particularly like the mystery science theater thing, but mm. for some reason, I think it really really works here. I think, and partly because I just adore Pat Oswalt, and uh, it, it is it is quite. Um, uh, it's well. It, this is very, very entertainingly done. It's really, really fun. Uh, there's an audio commentary on here as well with uh, director Tim Kirk and uh, Patrick Cooper, um, uh, who who helped put this together. Um, this is it, it's it's a lot of fun. It's uh, it's on Blu-ray and that's from uh, Kino Classics. It is Sex Madness Revealed. Um, if you like the wisecrack track concept, I, I highly recommend it. Also from Kino. A couple of RKO classics. You know, did you know that RKO is tied with Columbia Pictures for the most ever Best Picture winners? I did not know that. And it and and, and most of that, obviously, you know, early on. But uh, RKO by the 1950s is basically done. They, they won 12. Yeah, I, 12 I, did that. I did not know that. I did not know that. In what in, incarnation under what auspices does RK, L, RKO still exist? Does anybody own and put out movies? It's a library. It's just a library now. It's just a library now, and uh, these are basically. Put out through a collaboration between Lobster Films, Kino Lorber, and the Library of Congress. So somewhere in there, the RKO library, or at least parts of it, still exists for exploitation. Uh, these are two uh, collections. One is RKO Classic Adventures. The other is RKO Classic Romances. And uh, the Classic Adventures includes at least one really, really good film, The Painted Desert. Uh, it also includes The Payoff and The Silver Horde. Um, you know, the, which are these are all early 30s. Uh, early early talkies, pre-code films, pre-code uh, adventure films. The Painted Desert as a pre-code Western is really, really interesting and really significant. Um, and these have all been restored somewhere between the Library of Congress and Lobster, and they really look very, very good. Uh, the only thing that is um, particularly interesting about the payoff is uh, that it's got some, some kind of interesting character actors in it. Uh, the Silver Horde has Joel McRae kind of doing his thing, but The Painted Desert is great and uh, features Clark Gable in the first ever talkie that he ever made. Um, the uh, the Archeo Classic Romances has more interesting stuff on it. It's Millie, Kept Husbands, The Lady Refuses, The Woman Between, and Sin Takes a hol- Holiday. And uh, these are also all pre-code and much more interesting because they're very clearly pre-code. 
uh, Sin Takes a Holiday especially, and uh, and the woman the woman between, very risque, lots of stuff that would never have made it onto the screen in just uh, a couple of years later. So even though this is called RKO Classic Romances, what they mean is RKO Classic pre-code risque romances is what it ought to be. And mm. uh, some very, very good stuff in here. Some really interesting performances. Um, actresses that would not go on to do anything. Joel McRae also shows up here in Kept Husbands. Uh, so he's kind of a, a constant in this particular period. But uh, a lot of you know great actresses here that you would you would just that vanished within a few years. Constance Bennett, um, uh, Helen Twelve Trees, you know, uh, 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 Betty Compson. These are these are really really good actresses at this era, and they just went away. And also from Kino Classics, the uh, the latest in the American Film Theater collection, uh, which of course was a brainchild of Ely Landau in the late '60s, early '70s, getting a lot of great stage plays and starring them up and uh, and putting them out as movies. Um, this one is a Edward Albee's *A Delicate Balance*, directed by the uh, the great British director Tony Richardson, and with a phenomenal cast: Paul Schofield and Catherine Hepburn. Doesn't get any better than that. This is a great Edward Albee play. Makes for a very very good movie. Uh, it's you know not too long. Some of these things were verging on four hours. This one's a little about two and a quarter, and uh, has trailers for all the other available films. Uh, an interview with Edie, uh, with uh, Edie Landau, Ely Landau's um, uh, widow. Also an interview with Edward Albee himself, and an interview with cinematographer David Watkin, better known for uh, the Best Picture winner, uh, Chariots of Fire. Mm-hmm. And the other one here from the American, also from the American Film Theater Collection, uh, maybe one of the most interesting ones they did, is uh, Eugene Ionesco's Rhinoceros, yes. which uh, makes for a better movie than play, to oh, be yeah. honest. Oh, yeah. And mainly because it has the, uh, the cast from the producers, Zero Mostel and Gene Wilder. And uh, it's a great reteaming. It's perfect. It's absurdist, but it's so absurdist. Uh, it's just yeah. It's a- just, a- a- absurdism works better when it's done by funny people. It does, and it's just so much fun. Directed by Tom O'Horgan, uh, with whom I'm not familiar, but boy, what a fun movie this is! Uh, it's really one of the one of the one of the few American film theater uh, standouts that sort of transcends the original stage material. Mm, interesting, interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have Boogie Boy uh, from uh, 1998 <laughs> from the MVD Rewind Collection. Boogie Boy, I remember this movie. I did the junket for this movie. It, it, it was it was even a B movie at the time, but yet you could, you could still sort of get a get a get a release out of these movies back in the day. Mark Dacascos, before he was really doing the karate thing, so ridiculously young in this movie, plays a guy gets out of prison, wants to go straight until his cellmate uh, gets out and comes to visit him, wants, wants him to help him set up a drug deal. So, you know, fairly ordinary in, in that context. This is why I love this movie. Dig the cast of this movie. Emily Lloyd, young Emily Lloyd, uh, opposite to Mark DeCostas in this movie. A ridiculously young Michael Pena is in this movie. Tracy Lords, once the, the uh, I guess she was an 80s or 70s porn star. I can't even remember how long yeah. she was a porn yeah. star. And, 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 and actually made that little transition yeah. from porn into legitimate uh, acting work for 10 years. She was 15, in one of the Blade movies. She was in one of the Blade movies. She was yeah. on a couple of television series. Uh, uh, Tracy Lords in this movie. I, Le- I saw her on the sidewalk once in Hollywood. I just rooted her all the time, but I lived wearing, in North wearing Hollywood. Wearing clothes that left less <laughs> to be to the imagination <laughs> than if she were wearing nothing. <laughs> That's funny. Because uh, I lived in North Hollywood yeah. in the Valley. Yeah. You know, porn making capital of the universe for a while there uh, in the uh, in the early 90s, middle 90s, mm-hmm. whatever it was. Uh, so I ran into these people all the time. Uh, Leanna Quigley, the Scream Queen, is in this movie. Yep. A young John Hawks is in this movie. Crazy, right? And Joan Jett is in this movie, man. Yeah. It really, really strikes me as interesting, this stuff. Um, uh, uh, so this is the special collector's edition on Blu-ray and DVD. A whole lot of fun, packed full of all kinds of neat special features. Uh, in, including including uh, the director's commentary. So check that out, Boogie Boy. Uh, I, it was a fun movie, as I recall. Uh, when a Stranger Calls Back, which is interesting mm. because there's a movie called When a, Stranger's Ca- when a Stranger Calls. It came out in 2006, but this is When a Stranger Calls Back from 1993. Right. Um, uh, so, you know, it's the thing. They're both more or less about the same thing, though. This one, um, young woman's babysitting a couple of kids. Guy comes, knocks on the door. Can you call AAA for me? What's neat about this movie is you can't do any of that stuff anymore. 
this guy's this guy's scam to get into that house to yep. call AAA. You can't do mm-hmm. that anymore because everybody has cell phones now. Yeah. Uh, and nevertheless, uh, this guy is gonna. Th- he probably shouldn't have done that. Carol Kane in the lead. Charles Durning in the movie. Haven't seen Charles in a long time. Lots of special features on this 2K scan of original elements, including interviews with the director Fred Walton and actors Carol Kane and Jill Schoen, who I just loved. I, I love. I love. Uh, I, I love finding these rare gems of the sort of beginning of these actors' careers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just kind of neat uh, uh, to take a look and see what they were doing 25 and 30 years ago. Yeah, you know, so Veronica Guerin... those who don't know the story of Veronica Guerin, Veronica Guerin was a uh, a crime reporter in Ireland, and uh, she uh, let's let's not give anything away. Very famous crime reporter who wound up becoming uh, embroiled in some of the stuff that she was investigating. Yeah, wrote a series it, of reports. Right, uh, highly highly. It's very critical, yeah. and and ran afoul of the the uh, the criminal underworld. And at one point. Um, brushed up against a the very same figure that is depicted in John Borman's The General, mm-hmm. uh, portrayed by Brendan Gleeson in that. And um, th- it, this is a Joel Schumacher movie called Veronica Guerin. It's on Blu-ray, mm-hmm. starring uh, Kate, Kate Blanchett, Blanchett as yeah. Veronica Guerin. Yeah, and it's fine. It's good. It's it's decent. It's got a re- you know Karen Hines and uh, Brenda Fricker, a yeah, lot of really yeah. good supporting uh, cast here. Uh, directed by Joel Schumacher. Again, it's like our Joel Schumacher day. Uh, but here's the thing. I don't think this is the best movie about this story. Yeah. The best movie about this story is one that was made several years earlier in 2000 by director John McKenzie, starring Joan Allen. Oh, yes. It's called When the Sky Falls. And uh, they don't call her Veronica Guerin in the movie. She plays a character named Sinead Hamilton. And, uh, you know, Patrick Bergen is in this as well. And it doesn't have the budget that Veronica Guerin has. Mackenzie is not the flashy director that uh, Uh, Joel Joel Schumacher is. But it's a better movie overall. Mm. It kind of captures the essence of of the story and what happens much better. So Mm. that being said, you know, Veronica Guerin on Blu-ray, Kate Blanchett, I love her to death. But I prefer the Joan Allen, uh, John McKenzie movie. It would be an Sky interesting Falls. thing to sit down, watch him, watch him, yeah. you know, in, in, yeah. in a double feature, and see and see how you feel about that. Yeah. Audio commentary here with director Sh- Joel Schumacher. Audio commentary with the writers uh, Carol Doyle and Mary Agnes Donahue. Um, it, it, it just it's an interesting, an interesting. This an interesting. This has all happened in the '90s, I believe. Uh, I, the, uh, the, in Ireland, it just doesn't seem to have been any period where there wasn't some reason for somebody to get assassinated, assassinated someplace in Ireland. Uh, True. It's always, always just been the thing. So before John Williams wrote the music for uh, Jaws, John Williams did the music for Earthquake, which kind of got him ready. Earthquake was kind of like the last gasp of Mark Robson, uh, the great director of many, many big films in the, in the 60s. Uh, this is 1974. And uh, it's it's one of those big all star disaster movies that uh, you were getting at that time, Towering Inferno oh, and those Irwin, Irwin, all the Irwin Allen, Allen yeah. stuff. Yeah, and Earthquake tried to sort of one up them all by um, it had some great special effects, by the way. I mean, really, really good special effects. But it tried to one up them all by uh, having sense around, which was a fancy way of saying the projectionist in the booth is going to turn up the bass in the theater. And uh, that was it. Yeah. That was that was your sense around. Yeah, uh, I'm sure there was more to it, but anyway, a huge, huge cast here. You know, Charlton Heston and Ava Gardner, and then rounding it out with Richard Roundtree and jean vivre Bujold and Lauren Green and George Kennedy and my goodness, uh, even Marjo Gortner stopped preaching long enough to show up in this movie, <laughs> and uh, it just got ridiculous at a certain point. Uh, Victoria Principles even in this crazy thing, and it's co-written by Mario Puzo. Why? Because they just made the second Godfather movie, and he mm. could do no wrong. It's a crazy movie. Uh, I don't think it really holds up, but what I really enjoy about it is that if you're familiar with, uh, if you've seen Battlestar Galactica 1980, Galactica 1980, the show that um, that was the sequel to uh, Battlestar Galactica with uh, Doctor Z, mm. where there is a sequence in there where they imagine, uh, where they represent what would happen if the Cylons ever got to Earth and they would destroy things. They basically took footage because it's Universal Film. They took footage from Earthquake of, <laughs> of like the of the Capitol Records building, you know, collapsing and oh, all that yeah. stuff, and they just superimposed footage of Cylon Raiders shooting them. 
So now all those things are not collapsing because of an earthquake. They're collapsing because the Cylons are attacking Hollywood. I'm sorry. It's that's hilarious. Just brilliant, brilliant, it's brilliant. Hilarious. Back in the day sort of so filmmaking. So that's Earthquake. Collector's Edition from Shout Select on Blu-ray. Tons of extras here. Uh, basically all new featurettes, and they're really, really fun. And this includes not only the original uh, cut, but the... Uh, the uh the longer two night telecast cut from NBC. Mm. Yeah. Before we all got so damn savvy yeah. about filmmaking, and now we could all just I make know, a movie. Right? That little sequence worked yep. just fine. Yep. Absolutely true. Um. All right. What do we? What else we got next? Well, I got a couple here real quick. Uh. Um. A Blu-ray collection of horror movies. Three movies. I know what you did last summer. Yeah. They can see and oddly when a stranger calls. A few moments ago we talked about when a stranger calls back. This is when a stranger calls. Uh. On this Blu-ray set. Um. It's it's you know it's it's sort of an oddball parry of movies, but they're all pretty good. Of course, I know what you did last summer. A wonderful old movie. Uh, uh, oh my God, that movie's twenty years old now. I hadn't thought about that uh, in, in quite some time. Uh, Vacancy, Luke Wilson, Kate Beckinsale, and Frank Whaley in that movie is kind of neat Get a little movie there. And of course, Camille Bell and Brian Garrity in the original, uh, not the original, but the you know, 2006 version of uh, uh, When a Stranger Calls. So you know, if you're into those little thrillers, check them all out. Um, when, I know what you did last summer is rated R, as well as Vacancy. When a stranger calls, is only PG thirteen, so you'll be okay there. Not much in the way of special features, but you get three movies, so that's not so bad. Steve Coogan in Twenty Four Hour Party People. The I Michael, love that movie. Great Michael Winterbottom movie. Kind of introduced Steve Coogan to American audiences. Uh, frankly, that was sort of I think his breakthrough here. This is a great movie and one of uh, Winterbottom's best films ever. I think probably uh, it's on Blu-ray from Twentieth uh, Century Fox via MD, uh, MVD Visual Music Video Distributors. And uh, also, uh, not huge by way of extras, but it does have some deleted scenes, a featurette, and uh, two audio, oh, a couple of featurettes, but two audio commentaries, one of them with uh, Tony Wilson, and the other one with Steve Coogan and producer Andrew Eaton. Um, so it's, uh, that's nice to have out. That's been out previously. It's out again. It's worth it on, uh, on Blu-ray, because it's, it's Coogan and Winterbottom. What else do you need? Yeah, boy. Uh, Summer Stock from 1950. The best. Fantastic uh, a movie. Judy Garland. Judy Garland's last film with MGM. Yep. Uh, um, uh, and Gene Kelly, of course. Uh, a classic film. Let's put on a show. Uh, the, the farmer has a farm. Farm's not doing so well. This, 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 <laughs> this troop comes through. You know what? Yeah. We'll put on a show. Next thing you know, he's got, he's got these theatrical, these, these, yeah. these theater types. Yeah. They're, they're show people. Yeah. He's got these show people putting on a show, the thing. And, and again, Judy, uh, Judy Garland in her final MGM musical. Uh, it's just a lovely, lovely movie full of special features on this Blu-ray here, including a featurette, Summer Stock, Get Happy, a classic cartoon, uh, audio-only bonus, outtake of the song, Fall in Love, and the theatrical trailer of the movie. There you go. All right, Tim, before we, uh, we switch over to our interview, um, we got Soul Team 6 here, which is a collection Woo! of six black exploitation movies uh, from the uh, 1970s. None of which I ever, well, one of which I saw. Uh -huh. None of the others I saw. So I don't know. And we both love black exploitation movies. Um, so let's see how many of these you actually saw. The Black Six from 1973. Uh, mean Joe Green. Uh, nope. Not, didn't see, see that. I didn't either. Uh, the Black Gestapo. A, a movie that I, the name of which I know, but I never <laughs> saw. But, but, but I've always thought that title was so funny. <laughs> Uh, Black Brigade with Billy D. Williams. Oh, absolutely! And Robert Hooks. Movie. I have that movie. Richard and Richard and Richard yeah. Pryor's Richard Pryor's in that movie too. Very young yep. Richard Pryor. I have the yes. movie over there. That's it. Set during World War II. Uh, Black Fist with Philip Michael Thomas and Dabney Coleman. I've only ever seen the VHS <laughs> cover. I think it's whatever, but I did not see that movie. Okay, here's the one that I've seen: The Black Godfather from yeah. 1974. Which you know, it's uh, that's actually that's pretty terrific. Uh, Rod Perry and Damu King, Tony Burton. It's great. And then the last one is kind of a late stage one uh, with uh, with uh, Leon Isaac Kennedy and Jane Kennedy fighting mad. Of all the Leon and Jane films I've seen, and I saw most of them, yeah. and, you know, obviously the penitentiary films like that, because Leon and Jane uh, were married, yeah. I yeah. never saw that Neither film. did I. Neither I did I. It's a Vietnam story. It's a Vietnam story. So anyway, 
interesting collection of films uh, from the black exploitation era. Most of them have the word black in the title, except for the last That's one. That's how you knew they were black yeah, exploitation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't know. And uh, and uh, actually, uh, it really kind of obscure titles. So it's pretty cool. Uh, pretty cool if you if you don't have your collection rounded out. These are uh, these are titles worth throwing in. Oh, I got I, I have to see every single one of those. They to, <laughs> they're going to have to become a part of my class. I, I teach a class on black yeah. exploitation. So I have to this. This there is going to blow all the kids away. Yes, Great. sir. Absolutely. Outstanding. All right, with that, we are now going to segue into an interview uh, with uh, with the author of Dutch Girl, Audrey Hepburn in World War II, Robert Matson. Uh, we talked about this book uh, some weeks ago, and uh, it's an amazing story of Audrey Hepburn's childhood mm. in, during World War II. Those who don't know is that, mm. you know, she, Audrey Hepburn was, uh, you know, in, in growing, growing up in, in Belgium, uh, was part of the German occupation mm. and, and an extraordinary life in her extended family. Um, she, if you think she was that thin, that 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 slight, uh, because yeah, she was no. anorexic, no, 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 that had no. to do with starving. Yeah, uh, with eating three hundred calories a day for, for most uh, of her youth. It basic, basically, between you know, I mean, the, the German occupation of Belgium and the Netherlands, uh, where she was growing up, was was a was a significant horror. And um, this is the this is that story, and it was done with the uh, participation of her son Luca Dotti, and uh, uh, Robert Matson wrote a wonderful wonderful book about this, and I had a chance to talk to Robert Matson on the phone, and uh, here then is my dis- my conversation with Robert Matson about his great book Dutch Girl Audrey Hepburn and World War II. We are speaking with Robert Matson, who has written one of what I think is is it not a bio. A biography, but one of the great uh, kind of hole plug- plugging semi biographies that we've had in a long time. There have been a lot of books written about movie stars and certainly Hollywood figures and the overlooked aspects of their their lives and their careers that other biographies have missed. But I have never seen one like this, like Dutch Girl, Audrey Hepburn in World War II, um, which it gives you a completely different Audrey Hepburn than the one that publicity in Hollywood sort of led us to know. This is such an exciting uh, story. I'm just so enthralled by it. Could you just talk for a moment, how did you even get started on this journey? There's so much research that went into this and everything that, that constituted her life during World War II. Well, first of all, thank you for all the nice things. Um, I was in the Netherlands researching my book on Jimmy Stewart's combat career that was called Mission. And I was in, I was based in Arnhem at that time and learned that Audrey had spent the war there. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I I wanted to find more out about that. And so I tried to poke around and do some online research and that was kind of futile. And then I looked at her biographies and was shocked to find how little coverage there was of those years, of the war years in Arnhem. And I thought, if ever there is a subject for a book, how could it not be this? Uh, it, it, indeed. I mean, it's such a subject for a book. What did, what did your research constitute? What At that point, where did you go? What? How did you even know where to go? I was very fortunate at the outset that in Arnhem, well, in Osterbeck, which is next door to Arnhem, where the Battle of Arnhem ended up, it kind of migrated over to Osterbeck, and that's where British Airborne was holed up with the uh, SS Panzer Division around it. Um, that's the Battle of Arnhem, you know, the Bridge Too Far right. Battle. Sure. Um, there's an, a museum there called the, well, it's the Airborne Museum in Osterbeck. And they had an exhibit called Ella and Audrey in 2016 into 2017. And, and it was just this little room that had some mementos from them and it had some of her dance pro Audrey's dance programs and a wall of photos. And, uh, I was fortunate enough to be put in touch with the researcher who had put all that together. And she had already done this tremendous amount of research on the Von Hamster family. And I hired her to be my boots on the ground in the Netherlands. I, I was over there and, and did a, a sort of, established myself and what I was trying to do with the people are in the Arnhem area and Velp, where Audrey spent most of the war. And so I met a lot of people and I interviewed them and, and Mahdi, who was my researcher, 
Monty von Lander, she was on the ground in The Hague at the National Archives, and she went to the Gelders Archive, took me to both places. We looked at all these documents. Primarily, the, the first big thing was to look through Ella von Hamstra's secret police file. She was Audrey's mother and had been pro-Nazi, and so they did an investigation of her after the war. And just going through all these secret documents that were not public, do not quote them, you must not photograph them, but you can use them as background. And that's how, that's really where it all started. Now, you, uh, you've you done this before, we should point out. You have uh, two other books that you had written about the 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 dynamic part of uh, two celebrities, Carol Lombard and Jimmy Stewart. The Jimmy Stewart book is is terrific, by the way, as well. Um, Thank you. The where you know you're you're plugging holes for us. Jimmy Stewart and the uh, the fight for Europe was the book that you did a few years ago. Um, you crank these things out shockingly quickly. I have to say, um, <laughs> I, I'm sort of amazed that it, that you're able to find information, assemble information, and then put it into into the form of a book as quickly as you do. Um, I'm not even going to ask how you do that because uh, as a writer, I know that that's just a, that's about having an, an organized mind more than anything else. But what, what was it, what is it that you think sets Audrey Hepburn's World War II experience, um, apart other than the fact that she was there in Europe, that she was on the ground, that she wasn't like Jimmy Stewart serving in the armed forces, but, um, but certainly a lot of other European stars had World War II experiences, lived under occupation, um, but Audrey Hepburn's entire experience is completely different, and it's and it's a part, and it's what makes this such an exciting book to read, uh, almost more of a thriller than than a biography. Talk a little bit about what sets that apart. Wade, you just gave me chills because you know <laughs> I set out to write a thriller because she lived a thriller yeah. in the war. Um, her resistance activity set her apart. And the fact that she was under fire like she was for the last basically nine months of the war, that sets her apart. The fact that she survived the hunger winter, it killed 20,000 Dutch people in between 1944 and 45, just in like a three-month period from famine when the Germans cut off the food supply to the Netherlands. Um, those three things alone, the parallel to um, Anne Frank, who was lived 60 miles from Audrey, in Amsterdam, went through her experience, the diary of a young girl, um, was one month, let's see, she was one month older than Audrey. Audrey was born oh. in May of 29. Anne wow. Frank was born in June of 29. Uh, the fact that they both dodged the green police, you know, the, the SS Dutch police for years, they both were caught by the, the green police. And of course, Anne Frank and her family died. Audrey escaped. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there are so many elements to this thing that, that set her experience apart from like, a, you know, Marlene Dietrich, who, you know, went on tour and did wonderful things for in support of U.S. troops and the allied enterprise, but not, she didn't go through what Audrey Hepburn went through. Well, it, it's, uh, you know, and, and, I'm, and I've been looking here trying to find one of my favorite quotes in the book, uh, which I should have done before I, I reached out to you, and I, and, I, and I can't necessarily find it here. Um, it's, uh, it re and how do you pronounce the name? M-E-I-S-J-E, -E, the, the, the Frisian uh, woman. Meja. Meja. Um, yeah. talk, could you talk about her for just a second? Such a, such a really fascinating figure. Yeah, this was... Uh... Ella, this is Audrey's mother's sister, so Audrey's aunt, and yeah. she's Wilhelmina, but her nickname was Meja, which is the Dutch word for girl. Mm. Uh, and and she was married to a really cool guy, I mean, a very cool guy, uh, Otto Ernst Gelder, Count von Limburg Steerum, who was a, an aristocrat. They were, these people were all aristocrats, you know, very, very right. classy people. And he was like a district attorney in Arnhem who was arrested by the, well, let's just say taken hostage by the Nazis, along with a thousand other people. Uh, the leading citizens of the Netherlands were all held hostage in case there was an act of sabotage by the Dutch resistance, which inevitably there was. And Uncle Otto was among the first five to be executed, leaving Meja, a widow, and at that point, um, Ella and Audrey moved in with Meja and their grandfather, um, Baron von Heemstra, in Velp. And, and Meja was 
Audrey's mother figure. Um, Ella was a stage mother kind of a woman and really had the, wore the pants in the family. Audrey turned to Measure when she needed affection, when she needed a hug, when she needed a boost. You know, Measure was always there, and, and Measure was there through Audrey's life. And, and Audrey in, in the 1980s was there for Measure, and, and, and Measure died, you know, in Audrey's arms. You know, it's, it's just, it's a beautiful story. It's part of what made Audrey Audrey was. Aunt and see that that's what I got from the book. I, I I got the distinct impression, and you you make the case very very well without sort of spoon feeding it and and argue. And you you let the reader sort of uh, make the case to themselves. I would say that that Meja basically more than any other figure in Audrey's life forged the woman that we fell in love with in the movies. Yeah, nurtured Audrey's soft side. She wasn't going to get that from Ella, her mother. Um, and, and a lot of this kind of detail came from Audrey's son, Luca Dotti, who became my collaborator and, and just friend on this enterprise in the latter stages. And, and, and the, the detail that he added, he, he grew up with Ella. Ella was his babysitter and, you know, cool grandmother when, when Luca was a kid. And so he gave me that aspect of Ella. He gave me Ella because she was a mysterious person to me and, and I didn't trust her until Lucas set me straight on Ella. And he also gave me this wonderful detail on Meja and, and that relationship as well. Um, talk just a bit about the, the post-war stuff as well, which was also not easy. Uh, you know, again, I, we, before we started this, I mentioned that my, my mother was, uh, was German. My mother was a refugee uh, from, from Pomerania. And the Eastern Front collapsed, and you know she and my grandfather and, and my aunt fled while my teenage uncles had been drafted into the German army. So a lot of what I'm reading here sort of connected me to stories that I heard from uh, from them as well. And the one thing I remember from my mother most was when the war was over, the war wasn't over. Uh, it was a new <sighs> war. And talk a little bit about that aspect in, in Audrey's life. Well... You're absolutely right. You know, when the war was over in the Netherlands, the war began in the Netherlands. And that was, if you were a collaborator, a sympathizer, if you weren't anti-Nazi, you could be seen as pro-Nazi. And so there were investigations across the Netherlands. Everyone was suspect. And, uh, and Ella had a lot to hide. And Ella covered her tracks as well as she could. She had been pro-Nazi. She had a Nazi boyfriend into 1941. She put together these Nazi evenings, <laughs> you yeah. know, for the for society. And so after the war, she had to pay the piper. And that's what that 1948 investigation was all about. The day of liberation, Velp Liberation Day was uh, April 16, 1945. Ella was taken away, much to Audrey's horror, by the Canadian uh, police. You know, the military police came in took her away for questioning because that was the day all of the um, Nazi, <clears throat> Nazi sympathizer women had their heads shaved oh, wow. because, and, and were paraded through the center of Velp. Um, and Audrey feared that was going to happen to Ella, and it didn't, only because Ella was vouched for by the resistance leader in Velp, who was all, also Audrey's sort of handler in the resistance, Dr. Bishop Hooft. And, and Ella had to had to testify uh, at a certain point and um, make certain confessions too. Yeah, and make certain lies yeah. to protect herself. But yeah. I mean, you know, she still was okay. You know, but she did. She she lied to protect herself, and and things were so murky after the war that she actually got out of, away with it. Except she was labeled as unreliable by the Dutch police for her lifetime which had ramifications when she came to the United States. It, it was hard for her to get out of the Netherlands and go to England. Then it was hard from, to go from England to the United States. And there is a missing FBI file that has driven my D.C. researcher crazy because it's not there and it should be on Ella von Hainster because she, was, she had this attribution on her record, you know, as unreliable and as a Nazi sympathizer. The file is missing from the archives in D.C., and I suspect I know what happened to it, but it's gone. Wow. Are you able to say what you think happened to it? I think Paramount had it removed when she uh, 
when Audrey became a Hollywood star, it was too dangerous to have that file out there. And J. Edgar Hoover had connections to Paramount Studios in particular, uh, and could and Paramount could easily have made a call, and J. Edgar Hoover could have, you know, expunged that file. Wow, that's fascinating. That is, it just it, so the. I mean, the intrigue the, continues well into her into her career in Hollywood. It it, it followed her here. That's that's just extraordinary. Yeah, um, in the back of the book. There are my chapter notes, and my yep. chapter notes is really the backstory of researching this thing, which I think is as much fun as reading about Audrey's life, is, is reading the historiography you go through to put it all back together again, and, yeah. and, uh, and some of that's covered in the back there. Mm, it's uh, it's just absolutely superb. You did such a wonderful, wonderful job. I, I tip my hat to you. Uh, Robert Matson. you are, um, I, I hope there are more books like this. And you, this is sort of the, uh, the the notes in the book indicate uh, that this has been a trilogy for you. Uh, is there a chance that there will be more like this? You know, Wade, that's a great question, but the story has to be there. You right. know, if I can find another story like that, oh, heck, you know, Audrey has spoiled me terribly. How do you find another story like this? Yeah. But if there's something out there, I'd love to start down the research trail again, but we'll have to wait and see. All right, well... Robert Matson, thank you so much for speaking to us. The book is Dutch Girl, Audrey Hepburn and World War II by Robert Matson, um, forward by Luca Dotti. And uh, I, it is a superb book. I recommend that everybody go out and get it. It, it's, it uh, deserves a, pl a place on the shelf of everyone who loves books about celebrities and World War II and where those things coincide. Well done. Thank you for speaking with us. Thank you, Wade. I appreciate it.